Wizard of Oz, written adapted from the writings of L. Frank Baum, the ship Pablo Mino. Pino. The cyclone. Dorothy lived in the midst of the great Kansas period with Uncle Henry, who was a farmer, and Aunt Em, who was the farmer's wife. Their house was very, their house was small. For the lumber to build, it had to be carried by wagon many miles. There were four boils a floor and a roof, which made one room, and this room contained a rusty looking cook stove, a cupboard for the dishes, a table, three or four chairs, and the bed. Uncle Henry and Aunt Em had a big bed in one corner, and Dorothy a little bed in another corner. There was no garret at all, and no cellar except a small hole dug in the ground called the psycho cellar, where the family would go in case one of those great wild winds arose. Mighty enough to crush any building in its path, it was reached by a trapper in the middle of the floor room from which a ladder led down into the small dark hole. When Dorothy stood in the doorway and looked around, she could see nothing but the gray, great gray barrier on every side. Not a tree nor a house broke the board, swept a flat country that reached to the edge of the sky in all directions. The sun had made the plowed land into the blue, a gray mass, with little clouds running through it. Even the grass was not green, for the sun had burned the tops of the long blades until they were the same gray color to be seen everywhere. Most of the house had been painted. But the sun blistered the paint and the rain washed it away, and now the house was as dull and gray as everything else. When Aunt Em came there to live, she was a young, pretty wife, and something wouldn't have changed her too. They had taken the sparkle from her eyes and left them sober gray. They had taken the red from her cheeks and lips, and they were gray also. She was tender and gaunt and never smiled now. And Dorothy, who was an orphan, first came to her. Aunt Em had been so startled by the child's laughter that she would scream and press her hand upon her heart whenever Dorothy's merry voice reached her ears. And she still looked at the little girl with wonder that she could find anything to laugh at. Uncle Henry never laughed. He moved hard from morning to night and did not know what joy was. He was gray also from his long beard to his rough boots, and he looked stern and solemn and really spoke. It was Toto that made Dorothy laugh and saved her from growing as gray as her other surroundings. Toto was not gray, he was a little black dog with long silky hair and a small black eye with that twinkled merrily on either side of his funny wee nose. Toto played all day long. Dorothy played with her. They left in Julie. Today, however, they were not playing. Uncle Henry sat upon the doorstep and looked anxiously at the sky. It was even better than usual. Dorothy stood in the door with Toto in her arms and looked at the sky too. Aunt Anne was watching the dishes. From the far north, they heard a low wail of the wind. And Uncle Henry and Dorothy could see where the long grass bowed in waves before the coming storm. They now came. There now came a sharp whistle in the air from the south, and as they turned their eyes that way, they saw ripples in the grass coming from that direction. Also, suddenly, Uncle Henry stood up. There's a cyclone coming in. Coming in, he called to his wife. I'll go look after the stock. After the stock. Then he ran toward the shed where the cows and horses were kept. Aunt Em dropped her work and came to the door. One glance told her of the danger close at hand. Quick, Dorothy! She screamed, run for the cellar! Toto jumped out of Dorothy's arms and hid under the bed. And the girl started to get him. Aunt Em, badly frightened, threw open the child door in the floor and climbed down the ladder into the small dark hole. Dorothy caught Toto at last and started to follow her aunt. When she was halfway across the room, there came a great shriek from the wind, and the house shook so hard that she lost her footing and sat down upon the, suddenly upon the floor. There's a stri- then a strange thing happened. The house whirled around two or three times and rolled slowly through the air. Dorothy felt as if she were going up in a balloon. The north and south winds met where the house stood and made it the exact center of the cycle. In the middle of a cyclone, the air is generally still, but the great pressure of the wind on every side of the house raised it up higher and higher until it was at the very top of the cyclone, and there were lane and was carried miles and miles and mi- miles and miles away as easily as you can carry a feather. It was very dark and the wind howled horribly around her, but Dorothy found she was running quite riding quite easily. After the first few whirls and one other time when the house took badly, she felt as if she were being rocked gently like a baby in a crowd. Toto did not like it. He ran about the room, now here, now there, barking loudly. But Dorothy sat quite still on the floor and waited to see what would happen. 
I started got too near the open child door and fell in. And at first, the, the little girl thought she had lost it. But soon, she saw one of his ears sticking up through the hole. With was strong, sure. Uh, Pierre was keeping her up so he could not fall. She crept to the hole, got totaled by the ear, and dragged him into the room again. Afterward, closing the trap door so that no more accidents could happen. After, after, after. Hour after hour passed away. Slowly, Dorothy got over her friends, but she felt quite lonely. And the wind shrieked so loudly all about her that she nearly became deaf. At first, she had wondered if she could be dashed to pieces when the house left her. But as the hours passed and nothing terrible happened, she stopped worrying and resolved to wait calmly and see what the future would bring. At last, she crawled over the swaying floor to her bed and lay down upon it. To the follow and lay down beside her. In spite of the swaying of the house and the wailing of the wind, Dorothy soon closed her eyes and fell fast to the council with the munchkins. She is awoke, awakened by a shock. So sudden and savory that if Dorothy had not been lying on the soft bed, she might have been hurt. As it was, the jar made her catch her breath and wonder what had happened. And so put his cool little nose into her face and went dismally. Dorothy sat up and noticed that the house was not moving, nor was it dark, for the bright, bright sunshine came in at the window, flooding the little room. She sprang from her bed and, with Toto at her heels, ran and opened the door. The little girl gave a cry of amazement and looked about her, her eyes growing bigger and bigger at the wonderful sight she saw. The cyclone had set the house down very gently for a cyclone. In the midst of a country full of marvelous beauty, there were lovely patches of green sward all about. There were stately trees bearing rich and luxurious fruits. Banks of gorgeous flowers were on every hand, and birds were rare and brilliant plumage sand flood in the trees and branches. A little way off was small brooks rushing and sparkling along between green grass, remembering in the forest very grateful to a little girl who had lived so long on the dry gray pool. While she stood looking eagerly at the strange and beautiful sight, she was coming toward her a group of curious people she had ever seen. They were not as big as the grown folks she had always been used to, but neither were they twin as well. In fact, they seemed about as tall as Dorothy, who, who was a well grown child for her age. Although they were so far as look ago, many years older. There were three men there were three were men and one a woman. Always oddly dressed. They wore round hats that rose to a small point a foot above their heads, with little bells around the bridge that twinkled sweetly as the most. The hat was in the blue. The little woman's hat was white, and she wore a white gown that hung in pleats from her shoulders. Over it were sprinkled little stars that glistened in the star like diamonds. The men were dressed in blue of the same shade as their hats and wore well-polished boots with a deep bow at a blue at the top. The men Dorothy thought were about as old as Uncle Henry, for two of them had beards, but the little one was doubtless much older. Her face was covered with wrinkles. Her hair was nearly white, and she walked rather stiffly. Well, when these people were drew near the house where Dorothy was standing in the doorway, they paused and whispered among Dorothy listened to this speech with wonder. What could the little woman possibly mean by calling her a sorceress and saying she had killed the wicked witch of the east? Dorothy was an innocent, harmless little girl who had been carried by cycling many miles from home, and she had never killed anything in all her life. The little woman evidently, evidently expected her to answer to Dorothy dead. I have hesitation. You are very kind, but there must be some mistake. I have not killed anything. You have did anyway, rather a little old woman with a laugh. 
and that is the same thing. See? She continued pointing to the corner of the house. There are there are two there are her two feet still sticking out from under a brick wood. Dorothy looked and gave a little cry of fright. There indeed just under the corner of the great beam the house rested on, two feet were sticking out, shot and silver shoes were pointed toes. Oh dear, oh dear, cried Dorothy, clasping her hands together in dismay. The house must have fallen her. Whatever shall we do? There is nothing to be done, said the little woman calmly. But who is she? asked Dorothy. She was the wicked witch of the east, as I said, and said the little woman. She ha she has held all the munchkins in bondage for many years, making them slave for her day for her night and day. Now they are all set free and are grateful to you for the favor. Who are the munchkins? inquired Dorothy. They are the people who live in this land of the east where the wicked witch ruled. Are you a munchkin? asked Dorothy. No, but I am their friend, although I live in the land of the north. When they saw the witch of the east was dead, the munchkin sends a the munchkin sent a swift messenger to me, and I came at once. I am the witch of the north. Oh, gracious! said Dorothy. Are you a real witch? Witch? Yes, indeed, I answered the little woman. But I am a good witch, and the people love me. I am not as powerful as, powerful as the wicked witch who was who ruled here. So or I should have set people free myself. But I thought all witches were wicked, <coughs> said the girl. He was half frightened at facing the real witch. Oh no, there is a great mistake. There were only four witches in all the land of Oz. And two of them, those who live in the north and south, are good witches. I know this is true, for I am one of them myself and cannot be mistaken. Those who dwell in the east and the west were indeed wicked witches. But now that you have killed one of them, there is but one wicked witch in all the land of Oz, the one who lives in the west. Thor said Dorothy at their moment's time. Aunt Em has told me that the witches were all dead years and years ago. Who is Aunt Em? inquired the little old one. She is my aunt who lives in Kansas, where I came from. The witch of the north seemed to think for a time, with her head bowed and her eyes upon the ground. Then she looked up and said, I do not know where Kansas is. Oh, I have never heard the country mentioned before. But tell me, is it a civilized country? Oh, yes, replied Sophie. Then that accounts for it. In the civilized country, I believe there are no witches left, nor wizards, nor sorcerers, nor magicians. But you see, the land of Oz has never been civilized, for we are cut off from all the rest of the world. Therefore, we still have witches and wizards amongst us. Who are the wizards, said Dorothy. Oz himself is the is the great wizard answered the witch shaking her voice to a whis whisper he is more powerful than all the rest of us together who lives in the city of emeralds dorothy was going to ask another question but just then the munchkin had been standing sadly by gave a loud shout and pointed to the corner of the house where the wicked witch had been lying what is it asked the little woman and looked and began to laugh the feet of the dead witch had disappeared entirely, and nothing was left but the silver shoes. She was so old, explained the witch of the north, that she dried up quickly in the sun. That is the end for her. That is the end of her. But the silver shoes are yours, and you shall have them to wear. She reached down and picked up the shoes, and after shaking the dust out of them, and handed, out of them, handed them to Dorothy. The witch of the east was proud of those silver shoes, said one of the monkeys, and there is some charm connected with them. But what it is, we never knew. Dorothy carried the shoes into the house and placed them on the table. Then she came out again to the monkey and said, I am anxious to get back to my aunt and uncle, for I am sure they will worry about me. Can you help me find the way? The monkey and the witch first looked at one another, and then at Dorothy. And they shook their heads. At the east, not far from here, so on, there is a great desert, and none could live to across it. It is the same as, it is the same at the south," said another. "For I have been there and seen it. The south in, is the country of Quadling. I am told," said the little man, "that it is the same as the west. In that country, 
were the wicked sleep, ruled by the wicked witch of the West, who would make you her slave if you passed away. The North is my home, said the old lady, and, and as its edge is the same great desert that surrounds the night of honor, I'm afraid, my dear, you will have to live with us. The old fear began to stop this, for she felt lonely among all these strange people, and she seemed to greet the kind hearted munchkins, for they immediately took out the hunger cheese and began to wipe also. As for the little old woman, she took out of her cap and balanced the point on the end of her nose where she counted one, two, three, in a solemn voice. At once the cap changed to a slate on, on which was written a big white chalk mark. Let Dorothy go to the city of emeralds. The little old woman took the slate from her nose and having read the word on the ask. Is your name Dorothy, my dear? Yes, answered the child, looking up and drying her teeth. Then you must go to the city of emeralds. Perhaps Oz will help you. Where is the city? asked Dorothy. It is exactly in the center of the country and is ruled by uh, the great wizard I told you of. Is he a good man? inquired the little girl anxiously. He is a good wizard. Whether he is a man or not, I cannot tell. For I have never seen him. How can I get there? asked Dorothy. You must walk. It is a long journey through a country that is sometimes pleasant and sometimes dark and terrible. However, I will use all the magic arts I know of to keep you from harm. Won't you go with me? pleaded the girl who had begun to look upon the little old woman as her only friend. No, I cannot do that, she replied, but I will give you my kiss. And no one would dare injure a person who has been kissed, kissed by the witch of the north. She came close to Dorothy and kissed her gently on the forehead, where her lips touched the gut they left around shining mark, as Dorothy found out soon later. The road to the city of Emerald is paved with red, yellow brick, said the witch, so you cannot miss it. When you get to Oz, do not be afraid of him, but tell your story. But tell your story and ask him to help you. Goodbye, my dear. Steve Munchkin bowed low to low to her and wished her a pleasant journey. After which they walked away through the trees. The witch gave Dorothy a friendly little nod, whirled around on her left heel three times, and straightway disappeared. Much to the surprise of little Toto, who barked after her loudly enough when she had gone, because he had been afraid even to growl while she stood by but dorothy knowing her to be a witch had expected her to disappear in just that way and was not surprised in the least bye